first start off by introducing yourself? Yeah, of course. My name is Dr. Richard Obusi. And what is Icarus Interstellar? Great question. Icarus Interstellar is the name of a non-profit foundation, uh, which is 501c3, tax exempt in the US. And um, we're an organization of um, scientists, uh, engineers, uh, folks involved in the media, and we're all passionate uh, about accomplishing interstellar flight. And so our mission statement is that we want to accomplish interstellar flight by the year 2100. That's actually a pretty ambitious goal, cons considering right now we're not traveling that far from our solar system. And why did you pick that goal versus basically improving what our current space travel plans are? Again, a great question. I think it's important for us to have a tangible date associated with this. If we just want to be a little bit like, if we just want to say, oh, well, we want to accomplish interstellar flight at some distant point in the future, I don't think it's really going to compel people. It's not going to resonate with folks. If we really give ourselves that ambitious goal, um, then it's going to motivate us to action. You know, I can't imagine JFK saying, we plan to land a moon, a man on the moon at some point in the next few decades. We plan to do it not because it's easy, but because it's hard. You know, he put a goal of 10 years to landing a man on the moon. Likewise, um, the year 2100 is certainly um, a challenging goal considering the rate of investment we currently uh, uh, put into to space exploration and space travel. But, you know, I think it's really about uh, um, catalyzing uh, not only uh, public interest, but also government interest, demonstrating that it's a feasible goal. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, it, it creates something tangible for us to, to focus on. What makes an interstellar mission more challenging than interplanetary flights, such as the Voyager or the Pioneer? What makes an interstellar mission more challenging boils down to one simple metric. The stars are incredibly far away. So one of the closest stars, Alpha Centauri, um, is 4.3 light years away. Now to put things um, in context, um, Voyager, which is our fastest probe today, traveling at about 10 miles per second, would take on the order of 70,000 years to reach our closest star, Alpha Centauri. So we need to increase our top speeds, how fast we can travel, by at least a factor of a thousand to have any hope of reaching the closest star on timescales of a human lifetime. Now that introduces a broad set of other um, issues as well. So we need to go faster, so we need more effective ways of extracting energy from matter. If we're traveling faster, we need better shielding because a small dust impact traveling at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light is going to do uh, horrendous things to the hull of any spaceship. At those vast distances, um, we need um, incredibly precise and powerful communication systems. Um, we need um, great redundancy as well. If we're going to have a spacecraft that's traveling for decades, we don't want you know a fuse to blow, so to speak, 10 years into the mission. So the, the, the duration of the mission, the distances and the velocities involved are all what really amplify those challenges and make them many orders of magnitude uh, harder, more challenging than interplanetary missions. You mentioned that such a mission would take decades. How do you plan to power such a mission? For an interstellar mission, you would need power sources that were um, gave you a lot more energy capability than we than we have available today. So one way of doing that is uh, nuclear fusion. It's something that scientists have been exploring for um, decades. We've been trying to harness um, the power of fusion. A couple of um, promising programs we've got are ITER, or the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which uses something called a tokamak structure um, to heat hydrogen gas to incredibly high temperatures. Another possibility is called NIF, or the National Ignition Facilities, but all keep getting hit by uh, unforeseen problems. You know, we, we the, the common joke is um, uh, nuclear fusion is 20, 20 years away, and it's been 20 years away since since the 1960s. Um, what's clear is we're going to have to have some kind of novel form of power generation, be it fusion, be it matter, antimatter annihilations, which again is not something we can do today, but we know um, antimatter exists. We can create it in minute quantities in the lab. Or it could just be a question of beaming the energy. Uh, there's a form of uh, propulsion called beamed energy propulsion, where in fact you um, collimate a beam of high energy photons uh, and, and they impact a sail, which is used to, to propel um, a, a spaceship. So there are alternatives, um, and these are all things that we're looking at, as well as the possibility of disruptive technologies, which by their very definition we can't predict. Um, but you know these things have a habit of coming along and, and changing the way we view things like energy generation. 
for all these other uh, possible energy generation uh, devices, how come we haven't seen them in like the, in the private sector to power our power plants, power our cities? Um, that's a, a very good question. I think actually the kind of infrastructure, the kind of investment that you would need um, is huge. You know, we're talking billions and billions of dollars to, to set up these new, um, um, you know, set up these new power stations. But, you know, just to just to really um, convey a little bit more accurately. So there are actually some private sector um, programs going on right now. Um, so um, Microsoft founder has invested uh, something on the order of about $20 million into nuclear fusion research. There, there are a handful of um, private companies out there who are in fact uh, exploring the possibility of harnessing fusion. So like I said, it's, it's a high risk, high gain kind of investment. At the very least, we're talking um, tens of millions of in dollars uh, of dollars of investment, probably billions of dollars of investment. And, um, you know, if I were to hazard a guess, I would say for the private sector, it's just too risky until we demonstrate, hey, we're getting really close to this.